I love the look of that guy. Straight on with the script. She's in the room. Away okay. you go. Order, order. Tonya Antinazzi to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Chair, and it is a pleasure to serve under your chairship. I beg to move that this House has considered e-petition 599089 relating to taxes on motor fuel. And I would like to begin, to begin by thanking the petition creator, Michael Bromley, for taking the time to meet me last week to discuss his motivation for creating this petition. And with over 102,000 signatures, this is obviously a petition that means a lot to a lot of people. And I would like to thank all of those who signed the petition, especially the 152 people from Gower. I would also like to thank the Petitions Committee for running an online survey of petitioners to explain in more detail exactly why they had signed the petition. There were nearly 2,500 responses to the survey and the overwhelming number of responses reflects the strength of feeling on this issue. This petition is calling for a 40% cut to fuel duty for the next two years in order to go some way to combating the spiralling cost of motor fuel. It goes on to say that the price of diesel and petrol is at an eight-year high and that the government has the ability to sacrifice some revenue to appease the British public. Yes, I will. If the government are concerned that the fuel duty relief is not being passed down at the pumps, why is that not being addressed and in the strongest terms? Does the honourable member agree that there must be consequences to ensure that the public are not ripped off at the pumps? Uh, I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention because that is a really big concern to people because when there was a cut from the government of only five pence, but still that five pence a litre, we didn't even notice it. And that is very concerning and hopefully the Minister will be able to address that issue. But when I spoke to Michael last week, the issues that he raised uh, and that were raised in the response to the survey are the very same of my own constituents that they raised with me week in, week out. Michael explained that as a single parent, he could see the cost of filling up starting to mount. And as a company owner, he has had to make economies in the business as well. So he saw it clearly from both sides. Firstly, by reducing the mileage on the company cars and ultimately cutting the number of cars in the fleet, he, he mentioned that that was a big issue for his automotive business. Now, when we spoke about the environmental angle as well, Michael said that he was really supportive of electric cars, but there were still issues with the initial costs of electric cars and that there was a lack of infrastructure currently in place to support a mass rollout. But the AA has calculated that the cost of filling the typical 55-litre typical tank has risen during the year from £70.61 to £92.20 for petrol and from £71.94 to £99.48 for diesel. And there has been the most derisory of efforts to help drivers. For me, this is symptomatic of a government who have no idea about the impact of the cost of living crisis is having on people across the country. Rising home energy prices, food prices rocketing, and the cost of fuel at record highs. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will. My honourable friend, for giving way. And can I add in the, the views of the domiciliary care workers that I met with recently in Newport East, who collectively drive over four million miles a day to care for the vulnerable in our communities, who fear they may have to leave the profession because the cost of fuel is really making it difficult for them to get to work. And does my honourable friend agree this can only add to the recruitment crisis in care? I thank my honourable friend for her contribution because the points that she makes about care workers and they're on the road all of the time, uh, not, you know, that, that cost is, is, is takes, you know, it has a huge impact on the quality of our care service that we need to, 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 to uh, you know, to support, particularly at this time of year. So, yes, I personally think that it does contribute to it and I would hopefully like to hear the Minister's views on that as well. But ultimately, Michael would like the government to grab this issue by the scruff of the neck, as he said. And I'm sure he will be listening very carefully to the Minister's response. 
For me, the most telling thing has been the responses from the people who have signed the petition. And we've had, in, from 2010 and the austerity agenda, was very, very hard for so many people. And they had, you know, you, you allocate every month how much you're going to spend on fuel, and now that is rocketing. Those prices are going up. And we know that despite rising costs, many people have told us that they have to drive. They have to get into their cars for their job or to access essential services. With one man saying, we live in an isolated village with a bus service that runs once a week. Out of the village and then back again. My wife is disabled, so the car we have is absolutely vital to us. And as the honourable member, my honourable friend has mentioned, we've heard from care workers. And they have to travel between clients as part of their work, with one telling the survey, I am a home carer for the elderly and vulnerable who live at home, and we are paid little enough as it is, and with petrol prices rising so high, that comes out of our pockets and not the company that I work for. This means if I don't have the money to put fuel in my car, I can't go to work, and these vulnerable people do not get essential care. But this is also impacting on people's ability to visit and care for their own relatives. Where once people used their cars as a lifeline to visit friends and family, the cost of filling up has meant that they have become even more isolated, further compounding the impact that we suffered in COVID, during COVID-19. One, one of the comments that was made was that I haven't seen my mum in months because of how much it will cost me to drive to see her. Two years of lockdown, and now it feels like another worse punishment. My children and grandchildren live 100 and 140 miles away, so I have had to restrict travelling to see them due to the cost of fuel. The two years of COVID restrictions has affected my mental state, and not to be able to see my children and grandchildren has exasperated this condition. And there are so many of us having to make difficult sacrifices to get by. One comment was that I work for the NHS and have two disabled children. It's been a nightmare as I cannot afford to keep putting fuel in, but I need it as they go to a special school a few miles away and I have to go to different hospitals for work. I go without food so my kids have food and fuel, all because these prices keep rising. In many of these situations, there are no alternatives for people because public transport links are often not good enough and the government's lack of investment in, local investment in local transport has meant that the public are reliant on their own means of transport. I mean, personally, in my constituency, I've been contacted by a community car scheme in Gosainen about fuel price, uh, prices and also the approved mileage allowance payment rates. Schemes like this rely on volunteers who support those with mobility issues to take them to appointments, often NHS appointments, in place of an ambulance. The rise in petrol prices has affected their ability to recruit and retain voluntary drivers and will ultimately have a knock-on effect on the NHS. The volunteers also serve as companions to people who may be isolated and lonely. But this lifeline, and many like that across the country, are at risk if the government doesn't act. Now, when the Chancellor set out a cut of five pence a litre in his spring statement, we didn't think it would make much of a difference, and it hasn't even scratched the surface. In fact, last week, there were newspaper reports of this cut barely being passed on to the customer at the pumps, as my honourable friend has spoken about. And, you know, when we go to fill up, we quickly see price rises when oil prices go up. But we rarely see lower prices when the price of oil falls. Any evidence of profiteering by the petrol retailers must be looked at in full. And I welcome the Business Secretary's call on retailers to make sure they are passing on any cut in the oil price to customers. But we know that there is more that the government can do. We've seen examples from across Europe of governments taking action to deal with the cost of fuel. In Poland, the government cat, uh, cut, not cat, <laughs> they cut VAT on fuel to 0%. Something UK Minister says we couldn't do from within the EU, the EU so why aren't we doing it now? Ireland's government announced a 20% cut in excise duty per litre of petrol and a 15% cut per litre of diesel. 
France introduced a 15 cents per litre discount on fuel price on April the 1st, and they have given a 400 million euro immediate aid allocated for hauliers. The fund will be allocated to companies in the transportation sector based on the number of vehicles and their tonnage. And then in Germany, the federal cabinet announced a relief package according to which the energy tax on fuels is to be reduced to the minimum rate, about 14 cent cut per litre. Spain, they brought in measures to cut fuel duty by 20 cents per litre and Belgium cut their fuel duty by 17.5 cents per litre. The Netherlands, Italy, Slovenia, Hungary, Croatia, Romania and Sweden have all introduced measures to cushion the blow to consumers of these higher prices. The Labour Party has made it very clear that we would be introducing a windfall tax on oil and gas companies who are benefiting from this increase in prices. We've seen bumper profits from Shell and BP in the first quarter of this year, whilst prices have risen and risen for workers, working people and pensioners with no end in sight. And there is no sign of action from this government either. The Tories are out of ideas and out of touch. They should bring in an emergency budget urgently with a one-off windfall, ta uh, windfall tax to cut household bills and to support businesses. I know that the people who keep this country going, those who need to get to work, those with care and responsibilities, people who deliver our parcels and people who go out and enjoy themselves after two years of restrictions will be fascinated by what the Minister has to tell us today. The 102,000 people who took the time to sign this petition and Michael in Chorley will be waiting to see if the government are really willing to help with the cost of living crisis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 599089 relating to taxes on motor fuel. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This petition on taxing motor fuel isn't just about motor fuel. It's ultimately about the whole cost of living crisis and what levers the UK government can pull to address this, if it chooses to do so. Fuel costs have spiralled so much in recent months that, that prices have been breaking records. Indeed, for petrol, prices have broken records on 26 separate days in 2022. Now, fuel duty has remained at around 50 pence a litre for the past 12 years, but consumers also pay 20% VAT on the total cost of their fuel at the petrol pump. So that means that consumers pay tax, VAT, on the, the tax, which is the fuel duty, which means, it, which means they actually currently pay over 80 pence tax on every litre that they buy. They pay a tax on the tax. This is before the costs of extraction, purchase, shipment and forecourt sales are added. The Treasury is raking in 20% on the total cost at forecourts with fuel price increases bringing in additional VAT amounting to billions of pounds, all of which is helping to accelerate inflation. As the cost of fuel has risen, so has the VAT been raked in by the Treasury. Vast additional revenue for the Chancellor. Now, there was an attempt at some relief for motorists and consumers when the Chancellor announced a 5p cut in fuel duty in his spring statement. But as we all know, that measure was woefully inadequate. We know that a duty cut in theory benefits all drivers, but this cut, as we've heard, does, is not always passed on to drivers. Indeed, the RAC shows that this did not seem to be the case after the spring statement. In any case, it's clear that even if this cut were passed on, this 5p cut in duty would simply be swallowed up, it was swallowed up, by spiralling prices. So the effect of this cut would never be truly and meaningfully felt by those it was intended to help. However, a cut in VAT would be much more effective since VAT is charged on the total cost of the petrol or diesel. So even if the price rises, the amount of VAT would be reduced. So this is a much more impactful measure in trying to help motorists and consumers with spiralling costs. The situation with inflation is now so serious 
that a very serious measure to ease inflationary pressures must be implemented. And I would contend, Madam Chair, that having VAT on fuel until the cost of living crisis is under better control is now essential and overdue. The eye-watering cost of fuel doesn't just hurt motorists, although it certainly does that, as the cost of filling up the family car becomes more and more of a struggle. But the eye-watering cost of fuel drives up the cost of every good and service we buy. Every single item on our supermarket shelves has been delivered for at least part, if not all of its journey, to, the destina to its destination by haulage companies. When their fuel costs rise, so too do the cost of these goods. Now, I have been urging the Chancellor, as have others, for months now, to make a serious and meaningful cut to VAT on fuel in order to better control inflation across the economy. Because fuel costs impact every area of our economy. Anyone can see that cutting VAT on fuel is good for everyone across the UK. It will ease pressures on family incomes as they try to maintain their family car. It will ease pressure on the cost of doing business. And it will keep the price of our groceries and other goods down. Everyone will benefit and inflationary pressures will ease. That benefits the whole economy and it will more than make up for the loss of VAT receipts to the Treasury by such a cut. This is a no-brainer and a win-win for the economy, consumers and business. We are living through unprecedented times. Bold action and brave hearts are needed. The dithering and delay must end. Having VAT on fuel will have an immediate and positive impact. So I'm hoping when she gets to her feet that the Minister will tell us that she will be happy to go back to the Chancellor and his Cabinet colleagues to get on with this and cut VAT on fuel significantly because it's long past time. Justin Mudders. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair this afternoon. And um, can I just start by thanking my honourable friend, the member for Gower, for her excellent introduction, which was all, as always, was delivered with panache. Uh, I'm sure she uh, will have pleased the people who've signed this petition for covering many of the issues that they will want to raise today. So this is an important debate for my constituency. We've made vehicles in Ellesmere Port for over 50 years now. Uh, we have one of the few remaining oil refineries in the country. And uh, probably most importantly, people in my constituency overwhelmingly depend on private transport to get to work. 78% of people in Ellesmere Port and Neston uh, use a private motor vehicle to get to work, which is about 15% above the national average. I think that isn't just a reflection of our proud industrial heritage, uh, but it's also, I'm afraid, uh, and probably more so to do with the lack of a regular and affordable public transport service in the area. So I think the first point uh, to make is that whilst fuel duty and VAT are the same, that whatever pump you fill up at in this country, the impact on it is different depending on where you live and what you do for a living. If you're a shift worker, for example, it's far more likely that you will not be able to use public transport to get to work. And to be honest, if you have a job that finishes after about 6 p.m. in my constituency, you will be lucky to be able to find a bus that will be able to take you home. If you've got children, who you need to place into childcare or school on the way to work or from it, you may well need a car in order to do that. And if you're in a job that has a large amount of driving in it, then of course that is going to make a huge difference to how much you have in your pocket at the end of the week. And I think taxi drivers are a particularly affected group. Um, but as my more friend, the member for Newport East, also mentioned, uh, care workers are particularly affected. And of course the Minister will have uh, some reflections on that from her previous uh, role. But we shouldn't just forget um, about the impact uh, fuel has on other costs that we as a taxpayer have to meet. For the police cars, the ambulances, the school transport. There are literally millions of miles travelled every day that end up being paid for by the taxpayer. And they're often quite, quite often met uh, as a cost by local councils who do not have a say on the amount of fuel due to you raised in the first place. And as the Honourable Member for North Ayrshire and Aaron rightly pointed out, fuel costs also play into uh, wider inflationary pressures, particularly in terms of food and other services that uh, are delivered. So what you do and where you live can make a huge difference on the impact uh, fuel duty has. And that 
extends, I'm afraid, to some quite inexplicable variations in the price at the pump up and down the country. It might only be a couple of pence uh, most of the time, but that can very quickly add up. And I do wonder why the price on average is actually a couple of uh, pence more around Ellesmere Port, given where we are, compared to various other parts of the country when we are on the doorstep of a refinery. On a related point, and I think this is something my honourable friend mentioned earlier on, um, according to the RAC Foundation, the 5p cut in fuel duty uh, introduced by the Chancellor in March led to an average fuel price reduction of 3.3 pence per litre for unleaded and 2.6 pence per litre for diesel. Now, uh, in their defence, the representative bodies for the retailers claim that their members did pass on the cut in full, uh, but that prices were rising at the time. So it may not be right to lay the blame at the door of the retailers in Tyler, but of course, it's very difficult to get the level of transparency we would need to be... Yeah, yeah, I certainly will. We do recognise that the other issue is that very often the retailers have got no choice as to which distributor or wholesaler they go to. And if the wholesaler doesn't take any of the five pence duty cut off the wholesale price of the fuel, then the retailer is given a double whammy. They can't cut the price, and they're the one that gets the flat from the driver who expects to see five pence coming off the litre of fuel. The, the honourable member is right, and I think that goes to the point I was making about the bit needing to be greater transparency here. Um, and often um, it can be, can be difficult to know exactly where the, the five pence uh, in this case has actually uh, uh, disappeared to. Um, what I think is beyond contention, though, Ms Elliott, is that uh, it is our constituents who are not seeing the full benefit of these fuel duty cuts. And that is the key question, really, we need to be asking tonight. How are these measures actually going to help put cash back into people's pockets? Because the reason why this debate is so important at the moment is because we have the biggest squeeze on living standards in a generation. And the steps that the government have taken so far are, in my opinion, woefully inadequate. Prices rising across the world is obviously something that is, to a large extent, out of our hands. So it is inevitable in those circumstances that people will look at what the government can change to make sure that there is some respite for people and that help reaches those who need it most. And we have discussed the windfall tax at length in this place already. So I won't repeat the arguments on that again, but I would just say that... For me, that it is the fairest, the most effective way of getting help to those that need it the most in a fairly quick manner. Because, as we've seen already, although reducing fuel duty can help, there is a risk that it might not be passed on in full. And, of course, it only benefits those who have a car in the first place. And in the context of wildly fluctuating oil prices, those savings may not actually be felt by people at all. And on the issue of fluctuating oil prices, or probably more accurately at the moment, increasing oil prices, we should remind ourselves that higher prices at the pump mean that the government actually uh, has an increased income from VAT take as well. And research has indicated this year that because of the rising oil price, the government's VAT receipts on pump sales have gone up on average 7p per litre uh, for petrol and 9p per litre for diesel. Uh, which is, of course, far more than the 5p per litre that we have seen taken off. So fuel duty cuts may, in fact, be a sleight of hand that might create a good headline and may create the illusion that the government are actually taking decisive action. But it could be that these cuts are actually being made up for by increased revenue elsewhere. And it's actually coming out of the same pockets of the people who are meant to be benefiting from this cut in the first place. And if, if I may, Ms. Elliott, I have to say that this debate can't really happen in isolation from the influence of the Treasury, because we have to be realistic. They're always going to be the primary driver of these decisions because of the huge amount of revenue fuel duty uh, brings in. But sooner or later, the debate is going to have to move on from whether we take 2p off here or add 2p on there, because if we are going to meet our net zero targets, if we're going to move away from reliance on fossil fuels, uh, then we're also going to have to move away from a reliance on taxing uh, the fuels uh, that we currently do. At the heart of that is really quite a complicated dilemma. Move to a similar fuel duty system for electric vehicles. You may disincentivize people to change. And if you decide instead to tax people 
by the mile, which I know has been suggested in some quarters, uh, um, then uh, again you may disproportionately impact some uh, communities, as well as of course removing one of the major reasons for investing in an electric vehicle in the first place. And of course there's the whole question of whether the infrastructure is in place to make an, uh, a reliance on uh, electric vehicles realistic. I certainly see why I am that it is, there's a long way to go into getting a comprehensive charging structure in place. And we know that many properties, some say at least a third, possibly even higher, uh, are not uh, and will never be uh, suitable for home charging. And with there being a differential VAT rate for charging at home and at a filling station, there is a major inequality there that does need addressing. And I would suggest it needs addressing now before uh, the tax take from that becomes so high that it becomes impossible for us to wean ourselves off that as now as well but th those are debates for for the future what we do need now is more effective and rapid ways of putting uh, more money into the pockets of those who need it the most and for me uh, as i've said the best proposal i've heard so far is the windfall tax and i have to say with this being a cost of living crisis debate it is very disappointing that not one government backbencher has come to speak about this issue because i think that does show I'm afraid, just how out of touch the Conservative Party is. Peter Grant. Thank you, Ms Elliott. Um, I'm pleased to be able to begin this. I'm welcome in this debate. Um, unlike the Honourable Member from Ellesmere Port and Neston, the most striking thing about it is that out of 330, 340 government side members of Parliament, not a single one wants to come in and defend the government's woeful lack of action uh, in this specific element of the biggest cost of living crisis that most of us have ever seen and hopefully bigger than most of us will ever see again. Can I say to begin with that uh, I recognise, the SNP recognise, the Scottish Government certainly recognise the need to start moving away or to have moved away from our dependence on fossil fuels. The Scottish Government's record in the promotion of renewable energies um, stands comparison with anyone else in the world. It's one that I'm proud to have played my own tiny little part in as a council leader in the past. But the simple fact remains that for the foreseeable future, we're still going to depend on petrol or diesel powered vehicles for a lot of our everyday travel, a lot of our public transport, and a lot of the delivery uh, of the goods that our economy and our communities absolutely depend on. So we can't simply say that the way to deal with crippling increases in the prices of diesel and petrol is to stop by using our cars or to stop using buses or trains that rely on diesel uh, or other fossil fuels. There's a, a massive contradiction here in that Scotland remains one of the world's largest producers of oil and gas. We're one of the most fuel-rich countries in the world. How can it be that a supplier country gets poorer when the price of the commodity goes up? Somebody somewhere is ripping Scotland off, and I've got a pretty good idea as to who that somebody might be. And how can it be, the Honourable Member I mentioned earlier, that his constituency, which is beside a major oil refinery, has to pay um, more than parts of London, for example, for the fuel. He wants to try looking at the price of fuel in the places where it's actually produced and sometimes the places where it comes ashore. Because a lot of the remoter parts of Scotland get a double or even triple whammy. They have higher fuel prices to begin with. It's ridiculous when you think that they are closer to where the fuel is produced than any of the rest of us. Because they're in sparsely populated areas, they have to travel longer distances to get to school, to get to work, to get a doctor's appointment, um, to do the things that in a city such as Glasgow, London and Edinburgh, you can do by walking half a mile. It can be a two-hour journey in some parts of the highlands of Scotland. And the roads, um, although they might be in decent condition, they're certainly not designed for fast, constant speed travel, so that the fuel consumption per mile uh, on those roads is vastly greater than it is on roads in more densely populated areas. And that may be why, if you just look at the map on the page for this petition, on the petitions page, um, it's very noticeable um, how many dark colours there are towards the north end of that map. Um, the, the number, um, my constituency is actually uncharacteristically dark. Um, last time I checked, 
Van Rothes and Senator Fife had 224 signatories. My constituency isn't one that tends to get all that excited about Parliament online petitions, so that's quite a high number for this petition. Um, and I, I'll guarantee you that I've had at least that number, probably more emails in about the fuel price crisis and the general cost of living crisis just in the last few weeks, never mind in the months that this pet petition has been live. And it's important to emphasise the point that a massive increase in the price of fuel means a massive increase in the price of everything else because almost everything that we buy in the shops has been delivered in vehicles that rely on fossil fuel. I welcome the fact that some distribution companies and hauliers are now beginning to use electric vehicles with a much bigger capacity than they could previously. I welcome the attempts to introduce hydrogen fuel to some of them, but the vast majority of them still rely on diesel to get the food to the supermarkets. Um, if the hauliers can't afford to pay the cost um, of that fuel, then the price on the supermarket shelf goes up even more than it was before. Happily, yeah. If the, general, if the gentleman would agree with me that some hauliers are unable to pass on those costs to the supermarkets who have so much purchasing power and they're actually at risk of going out of business because of these increased fuel costs which is putting our supply chain under pressure and threatening jobs in those, in those areas where there are large hauliers or large employers. That's absolutely correct, and of course, if the hauliers manage to pass their prices on, price rises on to supermarkets, the supermarkets get together and they pass the prices on to the customers, um, which just adds even further to customer inflation. Um, I think the general answer to the member's point is that our system of food distribution in the United Kingdom is broken beyond compare. This is not the place to discuss that, um, but the last few years have made it clear that whatever else it might be, it's not a system that is fit for purpose and it needs to be radically changed very, very quickly. But looking at the government's response to this petition, we get all the usual platitudes and I look forward to hearing them uh, repeated by the Minister when she gets to her feet. But they pointed out the government doesn't set the price paid at the pump. The degree to which petrol pump prices respond to changes in crude oil prices is a commercial matter. Why? Isn't it time that the government even temporarily moved in to start regulating the price of fuel at the pump in the same way as they regulate, not all that effectively, but they do regulate domestic electricity and gas prices. If we think, in fact, if we know that somebody somewhere is profiteering, isn't it time for a regulator that can insist in the kind of open book uh, approach that the Honourable member, member for Ellesmere Port and Neston mentioned earlier on, so that we can identify where the profits have been made and we can identify what parts of the supply chain are struggling. I personally think that the few independent fuel station operators in the UK that are still left are seriously struggling. Um, I don't think they're the ones that are profiteering, but somebody quite certainly is. Secondly, on the, the rate of VAT, there's a, an extraordinary excuse from the government that exceptions to the standard rate of VAT um, are possible, but these have always been limited by both legal and fiscal considerations. What legal considerations are there now? I know they might have tried to use that excuse, or oh, the Europeans wouldn't let us do it, the Europeans wouldn't let us do it, although the Honourable Member for the Gower has pointed out the Europeans seem to be letting everybody else do it, but it's just that Britain that somehow wasn't able to find a way of doing it within the limits of European law. We're not in the European Union now. What's happened to us taking back control? It's not Europe's fault now. It never was Europe's fault, but the government can no longer pretend that it is. They can't pretend it is anybody's fault other than their own. And, of course, they pointed out there are fiscal considerations. Yeah, we know that. But if there were the fiscal considerations when the government decides to spend massive amounts of public money on a scheme to deport people to Rwanda that to date has not deported a single person, thank God, um, and they can't even tell us when, if ever, it will have the desired impact on disrupting the business of people trafficking across the channel. When there are things that get the government a headline that they want on the front page of the Daily Mail, they can find the money and the fiscal considerations are suddenly not that important. If you look before the start of the pandemic to January 2020, the typical or average UK price for a litre of unleaded petrol was 1.27 pence, slightly more per litre. The government took 79.1 pence of that in tax. After the government's very generous fuel duty price um, of a few months ago, in April 2022, the typical price was up to 161.7 pence per litre. The government's tax take, tax take was 79.9 pence. So in spite of 
all the crowing about cutting the duty on that fuel. The government are taking more tax off of the customer now than they were at the time, for the reasons that my honourable friend from North Ayrshire and Arden pointed out, because a significant part of the tax on fuel now um, is the, the VAT, which is a percentage of the gross cost, a percentage of the net cost plus 20% of the duty added back on again. It's got so bad now that energy firms are warning that 40% of their customers could plunge into fuel poverty before the end of the year. In the week that the Chancellor tweeted that it was nice to see the economy still growing, in that tweet he copied numbers that told us the economy is shrinking. That was on National Numeracy Week, by the way, as well, which I thought was quite um, appropriate. The Tories' response to the general cost of living crisis seems to vary from get a second job to learn how to cook. How utterly, utterly offensive that is to my constituents and to all of our constituents. It never takes the government long to come up with a scheme that they think is going to get the headlines they want in the newspapers that they want. If their political will was there, they would already have come up with a scheme, whether it was a, a duty of VAT regulator on a sliding scale so that it reduced as the underlying price uh, increased. They would have found ways to either permanently or temporarily reduce the tax burden on the fuel at the pump. They would have started making noises even about regulating the price of fuel in the same way as they regulate the price of domestic energy, domestic electricity and gas. And you know what? I bet if the government seriously started talking about regulating the price of fuel at the pump, the industry would sort itself out pretty quick. Because the one thing the big oil companies do not want is the public being allowed to see just how much of a profit they are being allowed to make at the expense of our hard pressed constituents, being allowed to make those excessive profits with the consent and possibly even the connivance of a government that simply does not care. James Murray. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the chance to respond on behalf of the opposition. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, firstly, I would like to congratulate uh, my honourable friend, the member for Gower, for leading this important debate on the e petition relating to taxes on motor fuel. And as my honourable friend set out, the fact that it has been signed by over 100,000 people underlines what we all know from our constituents, which is that the rising cost of fuel is a pressing and urgent part of the wider cost of living crisis hitting people across the country. With inflation at its highest in decades, the cost of living crisis is causing immense hardship and is driving households into poverty. At the same time, this government is alone for making us the only G7 country to be raising taxes on working people at such a difficult time. In this context, the rise in the price of fuel is being felt particularly acutely. The Office of National Statistics has published data on fuel prices which confirms what everyone knows when filling up their cars, that there has been a consistent weekly increase in fuel prices since the start of 2022, with the highest rises occurring since March. As an RAC spokesperson recently said, March 2022 will go down in the history books as one of the worst months ever when it comes to pump prices. He added that to describe the current situation facing drivers at the forecourt as bleak is therefore something of an understatement. Now, as my honourable friend, the member for Gower, uh, also said, the petition committee's uh, survey to the respondents of this petition has helped bring to life some of the real impact these price rises are having on the lives of people across the country. Sure. Way, and he's talking about the impact this is having across the whole UK. Every community, every constituency is affected. Does he share my disappointment that there are no Tory speakers, no Tory MPs who appear concerned enough to have participated in this debate? I thank the Honourable Member for her intervention. And uh, like her, it is uh, very depressing to see no Conservative backbenchers uh, apparently interested um, in this debate, although uh, if the best many of the members opposite can come up with is buy value brands or uh, get a different job, uh, I'm not surprised they have little to add to this debate. Um, and as, as, as other members have said, the responses to the survey the Petitions Committee um, have uh, put out really brings to life uh, some of the real-world impact uh, f that fuel price rises are having, such as the supply teacher, who explained the necessity of reducing working hours due to the cost of driving to different schools. An NHS worker reported the challenge of transporting her disabled children to the SEN school and having to cut down on food in order to balance the cost of fuel. 
a carer reported being unable to attend appointments to give essential care to vulnerable people, a taxi driver unable to make ends meet, parents having to remove their children from nursery as the cost has become unsustainable and people unable to visit elderly relatives. Fuel prices have been hitting people across the board and at the same time businesses have also reported that the increased fuel costs have made it more challenging to recover from the losses suffered during the pandemic. Respondents felt that the temporary 5p reduction fuel duty, as we have heard from many members today, did not go anywhere near far enough and was ineffective as the saving was quickly cancelled out by rising prices. When it comes to the price of fuel, the truth is respondents confirmed what we all had concluded about the government's actions so far. We know that following the spring statement and the announcement of the temporary 5p litre cut in fuel duty, the Chancellor was quick to arrange a glossy photo shoot in a borrowed car at a petrol station forecourt. But the reality is the 5p cut in fuel duty has been quickly eclipsed by the rapid rise in the overall price of fuel. Now, as we know, and as other honourable members have said today, fuel prices are just one of many pressures hitting people's lives. And as we know, the government's response to the cost of living crisis has fallen woefully short of what is needed. People across the UK are seeing the biggest squeeze on their finances in a generation, whilst at the same time, oil and gas producers' profits have shot up. As has been widely reported, BP's chief financial officer said that we are getting more cash than we know what to do with, whilst their chief executive has said that current rising prices are making BP a cash machine. In the first three months of 2022, we know that of the 28 of the, we know that 28 of the largest oil and gas producers made close to $100 billion in combined profits, with Shell, for instance, making over $9 billion, which is almost three times what it made in the same period last year. Faced with oil and gas producers receiving such bumper profits, whilst everyone else suffers the cost of soaring energy bills, Labour has called on the government to implement a simple, effective and fair solution levy a windfall tax on oil and gas producers' profits to help cut people's bills by up to £600. People need this help as they are left with no other options of what to do. As Martin Lewis, the founder of Money Saving Expert, has said, he no longer has any ideas for how people can save money to cope with a massive, massive surge in the cost of living. The fact that people are struggling and do not know what to do makes it incredible that the government has twice voted against Labour's plans to address this cost of living crisis by imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas producers' profits. We are left wondering what on earth their objection is, when the consensus that a windfall tax is the right thing to do seems to be growing by the day. Current Treasury Ministers may not know what to do, but the previous Financial Secretary for Treasury has said, the arguments against a windfall tax are at present very weak. He added that Margaret Thatcher would have backed a windfall tax on energy companies. Of course, in recent weeks, government ministers have taken a wide range of positions. We've heard opposition to the plan for a windfall tax from the Health Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, the Business Secretary, the Northern Ireland Secretary, the Attorney General, the Brexit Opportunities Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. Yet the latest position from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury is that all options are on the table. Every day of delay hurts people across the country. When a minister responds, I would urge her to give some indication of when the inevitable U-turn will happen and the government will implement the windfall tax. We have been calling for this for months and we are all waiting for the government to finally do the right thing. The Treasury's failure to act exposes a deeper failing at the heart of government. Whilst we have been pressing the idea of a costed and effective plan to levy a windfall tax to cut energy bills, the government is out of ideas and out of touch when it comes to helping people with the hardship they face. The Chancellor needs to get a grip on the situation. And so I would again urge the Minister, when she responds, not to add to the delay, but simply to tell us when the government will go ahead with a windfall tax that we all know is needed. Minister Helen Wheatley. Thank you very much, Ms Elliott. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I would first like to thank the Petitions Committee for organising this important debate and all honourable members who have contributed today, especially the honourable member for Gower who opened the debate and of course to more than 100,000 people across the UK who signed the petition 
calling for a reduction in fuel duty and VAT. Those signatures are a reflection of how hard high fuel prices are hitting people. As well as being Exchequer Secretary, I represent a rural constituency, and I know that in my constituency, for most people, most journeys, there is no alternative to going by car. Whether it's getting to work, doing the school run, going to the supermarket, the doctor, the dentist, visiting families, honourable members have talked about today, there's usually no alternative. If you add to those journeys all the business journeys, the man on the van, delivery drivers, logistics and so on, so much of our economy is reliant on road transport. The UK has around 30 million drivers and the vast majority of us fill up our vehicles at the petrol station. As many honourable members have said today, fuel prices have dramatically increased in recent months and they reached their all-time highest levels this spring. And I know that this comes at an already painful moment for many households with so many pressures on people's budgets from heating bills to higher food costs in the shops. I welcome the Petition Committee's survey assessing the impact of increases in the cost of motor fuel on petitioners which reflects what I've heard from my own constituents and from people I speak to up and down the country, whether that's the parents struggling to put food on the table for their children, care worker providing vital care across their community. We hear you, and the government has stepped in to help with support measures which add up to £22 billion. But I will say that the context of this is something we shouldn't ignore, that we are part of a global trend driven by global issues, by the surge in demand post-pandemic exacerbated by Putin's war in Ukraine. And just as these circumstances aren't unique or specific to the UK, they also can't be solved by the UK alone. Prices at the pump are not set by the government, nor are crude oil prices more widely. But the government has taken action to help people with recent unprecedented price increases. Since the launch of this petition in October last year, the Chancellor took the decision, firstly took the decision at autumn budget to freeze fuel duty rates, the 12th consecutive year of the freeze, and then went further. At spring statement, the Chancellor announced that the fuel duty for petrol and diesel would be cut by five pence per litre. That's unlike many international counterparts who introduced shorter-term relief for motorists, this measure is in place for a full 12 months. It's only the second time in 20 years that fuel duty has been cut, and this time it's the largest cash terms cut across all rates of fuel duty at once ever. It represents a tax cut worth 2.4 billion, 22-23. One moment, coupled with the fuel duty freeze, that's worth 5 billion overall, and equates to a reduction in fuel duty of around 100 pounds over the year for the average car driver. I'm happy to wait on the member. Uh, to the minister for giving way. Uh, she, she will have heard the suggestion um, that uh, the chance is actually raked in more through increased VAT receipts than is given away from this fuel duty cut. Would she say whether she agrees with that or not? Uh, the Honourable Member, in fact, comes to the exact next point that I was going to make in my speech uh, because the petition called for a VAT reduction, as did the member for North Ayrshire and uh, Aaron. Uh, when she intervened. Um, firstly, given that VAT is applied on top of fuel duty, the 5p cut, the 5p duty cut on petrol and diesel, does actually also result in a VAT reduction. So it effectively translates to a reduction of six pence per litre overall. That said, a VAT reduction isn't generally the best way to provide help with fuel costs, particularly because it wouldn't help many businesses most of which, many of which, already claim back VAT paid on fuel used for business use. Around 40% of fuel is used by businesses. So if we had just focused on reducing VAT instead of fuel duty, that would have left businesses more exposed to the fuel price increases, in turn impacting the cost of goods to consumers. So by taking, making the focus on fuel duty rather than VAT, that means that, all, that businesses will benefit from uh, that tax cut, uh, as well as consumers. One moment. Um, also, by helping businesses with that fuel duty cut, we make sure that the duty cut essentially will benefit, flows through to people who don't own cars, as well as those who do, because of the importance across the supply chain of the cost of fuel. 
Happy to give away to someone member. Thank the Minister for giving me. Did I mishear her? Is she trying to persuade us that if you cut VAT on fuel, it actually leads to an increase in costs to the customer somewhere else? Is that what she's trying to say? I think he's, he's slightly uh, mis... I mean, that, that, that's not what I just said. What I said is, if you particularly focused on reducing VAT on, on fuel, then that wouldn't... Uh, result in a, a, a saving to many businesses because of businesses being able to claim back, back VAT, which is why by cutting fuel duty, we have been, uh, uh, that, that benefits businesses and therefore the whole supply chain as well as consumers who buy fuel. I'm happy to give a right to member. Minister for giving way. The Minister, if I understand her correctly, is saying that if she cuts VAT, it won't necessarily help business. If I'm correct, then and she said the best way to do that was to cut fuel duty, then perhaps the answer, and I, I don't know the answer from what the Minister said, but perhaps the answer is to have VAT to help consumers and to, to, to put a substantial cut onto fuel duty to help reignite the economy, reduce the cost of living and to control inflation. Uh, well, well, then that's kind of taking us a long way into you know, what is broader economic questions of the right way of dealing with the crisis that we're in and the questions of where, of course, you raise money if you're going to put, make, make you know, further tax cuts or, or further support to, customer, to, to consumers. As already mentioned, as I'm sure she well knows, we have already put in support worth $22 billion to uh, people across the country to help with the cost of living, including $9 billion support to uh, help people with energy bills, £150 of that through uh, council tax bills, which is already going into many people's pockets. And she shakes her head and says it's not enough. And the chance has been clear. She stands ready to, uh, to do more. We don't yet know what the price of uh, retail cost of fuel will be to people in the autumn. But we, do, no, we are absolutely uh, concerned about the rising costs to people. And as I said, we have already taken steps, and that's what we are talking about today. The one other thing I wanted to just mention on on VAT, because it was, it was uh, suggested uh, as that the, the Treasury might be getting some kind of, sort of VAT windfall or something like that. I mean, overall, the OBR is forecasting that VAT receipts will now be lower than they had expected in the autumn. So there isn't some you know, great surge in, in VAT coming through to the, the Treasury. I will just move on to, to, to speak, keep to the topic of the petition, if that's uh, all right with the honourable member. Another question which came up in the speeches earlier, particularly from the Honourable Member for Rutherglen and Hamilton West, is the question of the extent to which the fuel duty cut has been passed through. I'm well aware of that concern and the suggestion that suppliers have instead been taking the benefit of the 2.4 billion tax cut. Some context to this, well, the spring statement was made at a time of sharp rises in international oil markets, which would have taken some time to feed through to the pump. And diesel, we know, has faced specific pressures due to the particular role of Russian exports in the European market, which has unfortunately contributed to diesel reaching all-time high prices this month, which does, those, those, those background movements in prices makes the 5p cut harder to see. But I do want to be clear on this. The government has been clear that we expect all those in the supply chain, from the moment fuel duty is owed to when it's bought at the forecourt, to pass the fuel duty cut through to consumers. The Chancellor and Business Secretary wrote to industry on the day of the announcement to set out this expectation. The Business Secretary wrote again last week to industry on this matter. The Competition and Markets Authority is closely monitoring the situation. Here I quote the CMA Chief Executive, Andrea Coscelli, she says the CMA stands ready to take action should there be evidence that competition or consumer protection law has been broken in the fuel retail market. A formal investigation may be considered appropriate, which could ultimately lead to fines or legally binding commitments. The government we will continue to undertake longer term analysis to establish the extent to which the Chancellor's cut may have been buried beneath further wholesale price, price, wholesale price increases and to ensure that the market doesn't fail to pass on the benefits of the duty cut to those refilling at the pump. I have also heard some public discussion of something called pump watch to regulate prices at the pump. And some comparisons have been made to Ofgem, the energy regulator. But I will say, 
and the comparisons often to the, to the role of the price cap in the domestic energy retail market. But that was introduced in 2019 specifically to correct the market failure identified by the Competition and Markets Authority, which showed that the conditions for effective competition were not present in the market. While the energy price cap has shielded customers from volatile energy prices, it was specifically de designed to better protect or disengage customers from being offered poor value deals. So to, to date, we haven't seen evidence that this is the same uh, situation happening with the fuel market because pump prices are conspicuously displayed outside fuel stations to encourage competition and allow drivers to compare the best deals. But I will reiterate, if the CMA finds evidence of anti-competitive behaviour in the market, they can clear they will not hesitate to act. So, in conclusion, I'd like to thank those. I will, brief, I will indeed give way to the honourable member. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as the Minister is drawing to a close, could she take this opportunity to let us know her opinion on our plans for a windfall tax? Uh, well, I'm interested that the honourable member uh, asks that question. And I did notice that while this is a debate on uh, fuel duty, uh, he took the opportunity, as did some other honourable members, to talk uh, quite significantly about the question of a windfall tax. Um, what has been made clear by the Chancellor, by the Prime Minister, it's not the Conservative government's in instinct to, uh, to reach for a windfall tax. It's not the most na naturally attractive option to the government. We want to see the energy sector investing in North Sea oil and gas, so important to our transition. However, the chance has also been clear, and we've been clear that uh, op no option is off the table to answer the honourable gentleman's question. Uh, returning to the topic of the debate, though, I will emphasise how seriously the government takes fuel duty costs. We have responded with a substantial duty cut to help motorists across the UK. The government and the CMA are continuing to monitor the situation extremely closely and everyone should be in no doubt that further action will be taken if necessary to ensure effective competition. The 5p cut in fuel duty is part of a 22 billion package of support in place to support people with the cost of living and as the Chancellor has made clear we stand ready to do more. Yeah. Tony Antionazzi to wind up please. Thank you uh, Chair. I'd like to thank the Minister for her response to the petition and I'd like to thank the petitioners for signing it and to Michael Bromley from Chorley for his uh, promotion and for uh, this very important uh, petition. Because this petition was actually created in, on the 18th of October last year and it closed on the 18th of April because they last six months. But what a six months that has been. He was concerned in October and many, many people have expressed their concerns alongside him. I think uh, it, it's, it's nine million was mentioned earlier that the government is helping people with energy bills through uh, uh, their council tax bills. And I just like to say, ask, well, you can't respond now, uh, the minister can't respond, but it was nine million pounds, I believe, that was the sum uh, that was given to us for the amount of PPE that was wasted by the government. Um, I'm sure that, that we know how easily the government isn't looking after its pennies. But we left the EU and we, it's one thing that we were promised is that the VAT would be cut on fuel and it hasn't been. There is a knock-on impact on costs as many members across this house have spoken about today and the government needs effective and rapid ways of putting money into the product, uh, the pockets sorry, of our constituents. So I would like to see, as, long, as, as well as the 100,000 petitioners, we want to see more to be done because what has been done so far, unfortunately, is they're not feeling the benefit of it. So I'd like to say thank you to the Minister for responding and uh, we will carry on from here. The question is that this House has considered e-petition 599089 relating to taxes on motor fuel. As many of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting stands adjourned.
splendid. The proceeding has ended.